some of the key missteps you think or mistakes that christians have often made about jesus i mean where where do you begin oh dear lord how much time um, do we have <laughs> <laughs> the rabbi it's a matter of not should you evangelize if you want to by all means do so and you do it not by telling the other person what's wrong with that person's religion you do it by telling the person what's right with your religion so what uh, she's suggesting that we respect other people's faiths really is that what elijah did with the prophets of baal is that what shadrach meshach and abednego did with nebuchadnezzar they just you know what they just respected other people's faiths seems to me that when you respect other faiths in the Bible, it leads to all kinds of trouble. Just look at Solomon, because they're not accurately capturing Christianity with these comments. As a matter of fact, these comments are getting worse and worse as time goes on. And we're back! I am fresh off the plane from Dallas, Texas for an event called Idea Summit. There we go. That was a unique experience. A lot of pastors there got to train pastors as well as do a Q&A with their uh, kids. I thought it was a great time. All of this in the middle of a huge ice storm that shut down the city. So that was interesting. And I'm using that word as a euphemism. Anyway, I'm back and I'm ready to party. By the way, huge shout out to Dr. Tony Evans and Alan Parr, who both gave talks at the event. Um, I was able to chat very briefly with the both of them. Great guys, very nice, very personable. Okay, well, today, let's look at an unbelievable video that I think is about a, a month old, six weeks or something like that. Or no, excuse me, it's a year old, okay? But it caught my eye. Now, this is unbelievable with Justin Brierly. So maybe this should be a debate teacher reacts, right? We have a Jew and an Anglican talking about the historical Jesus. Will they agree with each other? Will they disagree? Who is Jesus? Do we Christians not understand the real Jesus? Well, let's find out in this video. Let's talk about that work, AJ. Just give us a sense of what are some of the key missteps, you think, or mistakes that Christians have often made about Jesus. I mean, where, where do you begin? Oh, dear Lord, how much time um, do we have? <laughs> <laughs> I may, maybe start with with Jesus the rabbi. I mean, what? How do you conceive of Jesus? I mean, when you strip away the halo and the, you know, golden hair and blue eyes, what what sort of a, a <laughs> rabbi was Jesus? As far as we can, yeah, that's a good point. So I I am Gen X, so I was born in the late seventies. I grew up with a movie that I believe came out a year before I was born. Uh, and it's it was called Jesus of Nazareth. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You've seen this movie? came out in the 70s, and Jesus was this foppish British, uh, you know, pale, blue-eyed guy, and that's all I knew. That was the only Jesus movie that... There was no Chosen. There was no... You know what I'm saying? Like, there was no um, uh, Passion of the Christ you know, with Jim Caviezel, none of that. So blonde hair, blue eyed Jesus. Yeah, that's that's not it. Tao from the historical record. Yes, well, he's not a rabbi as we think yeah. about rabbis from rabbinic literature. Correct. Um, any, any more than Paul would be a church father as we think about the church fathers uh, mm. from the, the, the ante and, and post-Nicene fathers. Um, it, rabbi's just a t an honorific. Um, it's kind of like, sir, it's my master, my great ones. It's like, sir, mm -hmm. um, he's a teacher. Um, he is a lay teacher. He tends not to cite scripture very much. And I think when scripture does get cited, I think that's the gospel writer coming in and filling in the gaps. Um, I think he has an enormous amount of lay wisdom. I think he's influenced strongly by the prophetic tradition. He would have heard scripture in synagogue. I mean, that's what you hear when you grow up. And since he's not distracted by the internet or the local lending library, because there is none in Nazareth, script scripture is his base text. Um, I think, I think, personally, he had an experience of God. Um, today, we might call those a born-again experience or religious awakening or the bolt from the blue. I, and it was probably at his baptism that something struck him. That So, I mean, this is uh, important to note. We're listening to a person who does not believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the God-man, the incarnation of God. She thinks Jesus had an experience that Christians later have come to know as being born again. Okay. But in order to say that, she has to downplay or ignore the things that Jesus said 
to identify himself as the Messiah, as the Son of Man, who clearly was a reference uh, to, you know, Daniel chapter 7, where it says, one like a Son of Man ascended to God and was given glory, dominion, and a kingdom. Uh, Jesus referred to himself throughout his ministry as, as that Son of Man, who it was understood by the Jews would be the Messiah. And so, right now, I'm pointing things out that someone with a Jewish background should immediately key in on, but for some reason, Dr. Levine doesn't bring this up. So, it seems like she's ignoring these things, I don't know, or, you know, downplaying it, or I'm not sure, not aware, in order to say that Jesus was, he was just a Jew who had an experience of God in baptism. He was, he was commissioned to prepare his people for the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. Okay, that's fine. Where, where Christians get it wrong? Oh, well, they think that Jews are all struggling to follow every single jot and tittle of the law, and if they don't, God's going to snap them with a lightning bolt or condemn them to hell, which makes all Jews either, you know, sanctimonious or neurotic. And Jesus comes along and says, don't worry, be happy. Well, okay, so obviously Dr. Levine, she's credibly, you know, incredibly intelligent. She's speaking off the cuff. It doesn't seem like there are any notes in front of her. And so hyperbole and imprecision is just part of conversations like that. I do this too, by the way, you know, especially if I'm trying to communicate something in a memorable way. So I don't, I don't really have a huge issue with her take on Christians thinking that Jews needed to follow the law in order to be right with God. I mean, she's close, I think, to what a lot of Christians believe, what a lot of Christians think about all of that stuff. What I take issue with is her view of Christians thinking Jesus came to say, oh, don't worry, be happy, right? I highly doubt that's what a Christian's view of Jesus' overarching message is. Think about that. If you could sum up in a sentence Jesus' overarching message in the Gospels, would you characterize it as, don't worry, be happy? I don't think so. It would be, what, you know, the kingdom of heaven is here, or... Repent, pick up your cross and follow me, and I will give you eternal life. Um, when he doesn't, he actually makes the law more rigorous, right? The law says don't murder, he says don't be angry. That's harder. The law says don't commit adultery, he says don't think about it. That's harder. Um, that integration of the internal and the external. A number of Christians um, uh, think that Jesus came to do away with purity laws. Quite to the contrary, what he does is restore people to states of ritual purity. Um, so that when people who are in states of impurity, like a hemorrhaging woman, it's probably a vaginal or uterine hemorrhage. Now, I know people might be listening to this over dinner, and they don't want to hear such things, but you know, it's in the Bible. Um, it, there's no law yeah. saying, you know, lady, you have to be locked up in some back shed. Um, there's no law against touching somebody with leprosy. So what he's... You know, The Chosen just did an episode on this, right? The, the bleeding woman who grabbed one of Jesus' tassels uh, on the hem of his garment and was healed. Uh, which, by the way, was an implicit expression of the woman's recognition that Jesus was the Messiah. She knew he was the Messiah, and therefore she remembered the, the teaching from the book of Malachi on the Messiah. It said that uh, this person would have healing in his wings. The word wings in Hebrew also means tassels, you know, the hem of his garment, in other words. So the fact that she grabbed Jesus' tassel with the expectation of being healed, is her way of communicating that she believed he was the Messiah. It's a, it's a powerful historical moment there. Is, he's restoring people to states of ritual purity. Um, when he debates with fellow Jews about the law, like, can you pluck grain on the Sabbath, which in fact he's not doing, his disciples are doing it. That's a, that's a debate at the time. Um, and Joss points this out in the book. You know, the law says, honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. Um, and I'm just paraphrasing here. You know, one Jew looks at another and says, what constitutes work? And now you have two synagogues, right? Because um, we're still <laughs> debating that. So he debates with fellow Jews about how to follow the law, but that doesn't take him away from the law. You don't debate something in which you have no investment. Correct. Um, a number of my Christian friends think that Jesus invented feminism and that first century Jewish women were oppressed and repressed and depressed and suppressed by this horrible patriarchal androcentric tradition. And Jesus comes along and says, oh, no, everybody's equal. No, to the contrary. Um, if he did, then six out of the 12 apostles would have been women, right? And, and the mom would have gotten some higher role. He, he's a first century patriarchal Jew who has women followers, as did Pharisees, as did John the Baptist, as did others. The, the other, the other yeah, I. so I'm not too familiar with 
whether or not itinerant rabbis, let alone first century Pharisees, had female disciples. Maybe they did. And so, I mean, again, not a whole lot of issue that I would take with what Dr. Levine is saying right at this point. It's just her conclusions that don't travel the eternal distance necessary to truly understand Jesus and what he was accomplishing here on earth. That's what I take issue with. I will say this. She seems to speak as if Jesus wants to maintain the law of Moses. And I suppose this suggests that she thinks Christians believe that Jesus came to abolish the law. And and maybe there are Christians who think that. But those of us who are careful to read and teach the scripture do remember Jesus literally saying, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Right? But then the $6 million question to that is, what did he mean? Did he mean that the law of Moses should remain in play as part of the outworking of the Mosaic Covenant established at Sinai? Or did he mean that he is the perfect fulfillment of the law, perfectly embodying and living up to that requirement, and therefore being the fulfillment of God's law, by proxy, so to speak, for those who will follow after him and trust in him? See, Christians believe the latter. And because we do, we recognize that fulfilling the law is not the goal. The goal is to know God, to return to the Edenic relationship that mankind once had in the garden. And Jesus accomplishes that for us. Romans 8.3 says, For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that... The righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law in us because he lived a sinless life, and now it's his righteousness that we are identified by. Why? Why is that the case? Because we are his haverim. We are his disciples. We are following after him and abiding in him, and the dust of his sandals are all over us. So, if you're watching this and you are an Orthodox Jew, or you know one, right, please consider this conversation. Please consider my reaction to it. Send this video around, because it would be a shame, a real shame, for someone of the Jewish faith to dismiss Jesus without really considering what he actually said and what he actually was talking about and what he meant. Justin, can I just put it this way? Yeah, go ahead, Jesus yeah. wasn't. Jesus wasn't a Christian. This is, this is the sort of, this I think is the sort of like, this is the key mistake, is that Christians think Jesus was a Christian. And that this is, Christianity is weird as a religion, <laughs> insofar as the person who, as it were, founded it, wasn't a member of the religion that he actually founded. Now, this is a yes. very weird mm, business mm. about Christianity, and it distorts people's thinking. Jesus never heard the word Christian. That wasn't in his mindset, okay? I guess I agree with that, right? Jesus was not a Christian, right? Because to be a Christian is to be a little Christ, which was originally coined in the first century to be a slur against Christians. Then it was wielded against them as such. So I agree with that. You know, again, we Christians are Jesus' disciples, and it is the job of the disciple to be like our teacher. But where is this going? <laughs> <laughs> like that, that's a you know okay Jesus is not a Christian but where is where are we headed here let's find out can I ask a question about that because I I, yes. I I like your point but I want you to develop it just a little bit more yes so, right and, and I think you're right so when you say that people think Jesus is a Christian and he's not what's the connotation of Christian that they're uploading to what Jesus is yeah well it's that so that they are they are up, they are projecting back onto him a sort of post-Nicene or post-Augustinian or the, the, the 2,000 years of sort of what you what what has come to be understood as Christianity but particularly post you know the, the sort of stuff that Paul does with 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 Christianity now I just don't think that's a part of Jesus was a uh, temple going Jew who although he had arguments with the temple and you know Jews having arguments with Jews, by the way, is not an unknown thing. Um, I mean, he he wasn't unique in having arguments with the with the temple authorities. I mean, I have to say, the Qumran lot probably even more so in terms of their arguments with uh, with the temple authorities. But we we 
so readily project back. I mean, we, we've got used to the idea. It's not a controversial thing to now say, obviously, Jesus wasn't blonde hair and blue eyed. So we've we've you know, lots of people have have, have we've have got, got that far. That. Very, very good. That's that's great. But now let's actually let's let's keep on going with with where that goes and say, actually, Jesus, Jesus was didn't have this sort of fully formed Christian um, philosophy. Jesus is Jesus referencing. Um, boy. So with this kind of conversation, it's it's a little difficult because you you have, uh, you know, this is extemporaneous off the cuff, and there's you know a tangential nature to, at least, uh, with this gentleman the way that he's talking. So you're trying to track it, right? And I'm hearing a little bit of it, right? That that basically there is a difference between, I guess, the philosophy of of Jesus and the philosophy of Christians today, he starts to talk about perhaps it, it was introduced with Paul, so maybe Paul came in and and started coloring in areas that Jesus didn't intend to. I mean, a lot of this is implicit and suggested, right? Which is interesting because Paul was not post-Nicene. Paul was a Jew, so that's weird. Um, but I guess the question that comes to mind is, what exactly is it about the Christian's philosophy today that does not align with the Jesus of history. You know what I mean? Like, what is antithetical to Jesus' teachings or Jesus' own philosophy? And I'm not actually hearing anything, right? Or or was it just supposed to be the blonde hair, blue-eyed Jesus comment? Because I got news for everyone. Hollywood's portrayal of Jesus never confused those of us who read the Bible and have understood for thousands of years that Jesus was a Jew, born in Bethlehem and raised in Nazareth. This is what I'd say, and I'd like to, uh, what, to hear what AJ says about this. We call it mm. the New Testament. I mean, we, we're used to knowing that we shouldn't really call the Old Testament the Old Testament, the sort of supersessionism. I call it the Hebrew Scriptures. But the New Testament is, there's not that much new in the New Testament. Okay, this is a very, this is a thing that actually so much of the New Testament is drawn from the book of Isaiah or from, from the Hebrew Scriptures doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense as a book without being understood in terms of the Hebrew Scriptures. So, there's not much new in the New Testament, and that's what Christians really have to understand. Okay, this is actually a great point. All right, I agree with this. This, this is why I have said that we as Christians today should try our best to understand the Jewishness of discipleship and the Jewishness of Jesus. I literally just said this in a video last week or something like that. Somebody recently responded to me, to, to what I said the other week, and they warned me about becoming a Judaizer or something. It's not about that at all. The goal is to know God more. And the way to know God is by reading His Word. But when you do that, we have to recognize that the vast majority of what Jesus said is either quoting from, alluding to, or referencing in some kind of way the Old Testament. Right? Pop quiz. You ready for this? Which book of the Bible did Jesus quote from the most? Which book of the Torah did Jesus quote from? Anybody? Deuteronomy. Did you know that? Well, and I mean, his disciples did the same thing, by the way. When Peter stood before everyone at Pentecost in the book of Acts, he said, what is happening right now in front of you is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel. Right? Paul quoted uh, the Old Testament in his letters. In Romans chapter 1, you know, the famous sort of thematic statement of the whole letter in verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? But then he says in the next verse, verse 17, for as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. He's quoting the Old Testament. He's quoting Habakkuk. So, yeah, I agree with uh, this gentleman's assessment. Does that mean that Christians today somehow have some kind of philosophy that is antithetical to the Jesus of history? No. It just means that in order to fulfill our purpose, which is to know God, then we should do our best to understand the Bible that we have in our hands, and that requires understanding more about the Jewishness of Jesus. Why did the Christian revolution take place if, if he it was, in a sense, so typical of, of other Jewish people at the time? Well, part of it is packaging. Um, you can have Jews who were known as healers, and there were other charismatic healers or exorcists at the time, and I think Jesus was a healer and an exorcist. You can have other people who are teachers and they're charismatic. You have people who um, convince others to leave their mothers and fathers and spouses and children and follow him. 
um, and that becomes a sectarian movement. Um, when you put it all together and then you have a group of his followers who are convinced that he is Lord and Savior and therefore convinced because they experienced him as having risen from the dead, that gives you something that's quite distinct. Um, it, he does say some things that I can't track elsewhere. He's the only person I know who, who comes out and says, you have to love your enemies, um, which is really hard. Um, Jewish law says you, ha you can't mistreat them. If you're hungry, you've got to feed them, right? If they're, mm -hmm. if they're lying in a ditch, you've got to take care of them. But nothing says you have to love them. Jesus just ups the ante a little bit or a lot. Um, Jesus talks about making well, a so, new... So I really do appreciate uh, this window into the conversation between someone like Dr. Levine with her level of expertise and the other gentleman here... Um, and that's why I love Unbelievable as a show. I think Justin Brierley does a great job with it. <laughs> what I'm finding a little difficult at the moment is someone like Dr. Levine treating love the way that the rest of us would. What do I mean by that? I mean that we look at love and we speak about it and we think about it the way that a Greek would. Uh, love to us in our modern Western sensibilities is a feeling. It, it's a feeling that is actually distinguished from action. It's, it's distinct. Uh, a biblical Jew would not distinguish. Th they would not separate out love from action. As a matter of fact, a biblical Jew would understand that love is a verb. And so you just cannot disentangle the concept from the action. It's funny because... Uh, this same problem pops up in the book of James. So James says, faith without action is dead. But he's saying the same thing here. You cannot disentangle faith from action, such that if you say you have faith, but never act on it, you don't have faith. Well, it's the same thing with love. If you say you have love and you do not obey Jesus, you don't love him. But, but that concept is not new. When you read the Old Testament, there are commands to perform actions that take care of your enemy. Dr. Levine just admitted that they exist, right? Proverbs 25 tells us, if your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. And if you do this, God will reward you. Well, these actions are an expression of love. How do I know that? Well, because Paul quotes Proverbs chapter 25 and Romans chapter 12, and he says, these are expressions of love and goodness. And who was Paul? Paul was a Jew of all Jews, a Pharisee of all Pharisees. He understood that love is a verb, and it's expressed in action. So when Jesus says, love your enemies, it's not a new concept. He's reorienting the Israelites of the first century to the spirit of the commands that were given in the Old Testament. Even when he initiates a new covenant in his blood, he's not pulling something out of thin air. What he's doing was promised all the way back in Jeremiah and Ezekiel. So, not new, um, more challenging, yes. Covenant in his blood. I don't know anybody else who's doing. That's interesting. Um, so, he has his own distinctive parts and a, a great much of his teaching when it comes to things like ethics, morality, storytelling, that's part of the culture. I also would not dismiss charisma. Certain people have it and certain people don't. And you can and you can just see this if you watch theater, right? You get the main the 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 actor who was hired to play the part and it's fabulous. You get the understudy and the evening was a disaster. Same words, <laughs> different presentations. So won't leave that. Well, same thing is true of preaching. You know, you get the people at church, you know what I'm talking about. You get the main teacher the main teaching pastor up there, and everyone is edified. He's sick, or he's got to go on vacation, or he's on sabbatical, and you get the understudy up there, and when the pastor's gone, meh. You know what I mean? <laughs> it is what it is. I want to take issue with something that Giles said, right? Because I'm an American, and go we're on. crude. And, yeah. you know, I actually think um, that the term Old Testament should be recuperated. Ah. In, the, in the same way that we recuperate words like queer, which is a perfectly normal term to oh, use these days, and it can be quite complimentary. Why? Well, first of all, um, it, at last time I checked, which was last night when I was finishing your book, you're still an Anglican. And in your Old Testament, you have Greek stuff. So if you talk about the Hebrew Bible, you're actually chopping off part of your canon. 
um, Hebrew Bible is a, is a Protestant term. You're not a Protestant. You're part of the Catholic community, right? I'm so you both. got books like yeah, Judith. We're, we're which, about I, you know, <laughs> Judith and Susanna. You got the books of the Maccabees. We, the holiday of Hanukkah, you got the books of the Maccabees. It's a fair trade. Um, so I, I don't like Old Testament, uh, Hebrew Bible, and I also don't like it because it suggests that Jews and Christians are reading the same canon, and we are not. Because the story that the Old Testament tells starting with Genesis and ending with Malachi, the prophet Malachi, is a promise model. Everything drives toward Jesus. And that's how his early followers read the text. And he may have read it the same way if he thought he was commissioned in that sense. So it's a promise model. And then you get the fulfillment model and you get it really coolly. To so that's interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm chewing on that. Protestants have packaged the Old Testament Bible in a particular way so as to create a promise model. And then she said, and that's the way that the followers of Jesus, the disciples of Jesus, understood the Old Testament. Well, how did they, if the Protestants packaged the Old Testament after the disciples of Jesus, how would the disciples of Jesus understood this as a promise model if the packaging was the thing that created the promise model? Maybe I missed something. Let's keep watching. Go back to that baptism scene. You have, by the way, a lovely picture of you and your child in the river. That's that's how the book ends. I think it was great <laughs> before the back matter. Um, uh, so what happens? Malachi predicts right at the end of Malachi, the end of the Old Testament, uh, the coming of Elijah mm -hmm. to announce the Messianic Age. And then the Gospel of Mark, which is probably the first gospel that we have, begins with John the Baptist in the role of Elijah, announcing not the Messianic Age, but the Messiah. Jesus. So it's a promise fulfillment model. So you know the problem is not about the old bit. The old the problem is the old and the new juxtaposition. It implies this form of supersessionism yeah. which that Christianity is a sort of upgrade of Judaism. And this is the problem. Seeing it as a sort of like, you know, well that that's how it used to be, but yeah. now it's this. Okay. And that's what's implied by that. And that's that that is a bob that's bothersome. Yeah, I'd I'd rather so what this gentleman is saying, what is this gentleman? I keep saying gentleman, Fraser, Mr. Fraser. What Mr. Fraser is saying is he keeps referring to supersessionism, right? What is supersessionism? Supersessionism refers, it's, it's a term that points to something called a replacement theology. So not going to get into that topic. Uh, don't have the time for it. But what is going on in the Bible is this. God is setting aside people. People who he loves and who love him. And through these people, he is redeeming the world. He's putting the world back together after it has been broken. That means then that Christianity is just the most recent expression of this redemption story. But the story didn't start with Christians, okay? The people of God didn't begin with Christians. It began much earlier uh, with, with uh, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and others— such that there is this divine family tree that we see growing up through the history of humanity that we discover in the Bible. The Apostle Paul gives us this picture of a divine family tree, by the way, in Romans chapter 11. And Christians are the most contemporary branches of this tree. But this brings me back to the point that I've been trying to make, you know, which is in order to fulfill our purpose as Christians, we need to understand on a deeper level this divine tree. Why? Because then we'll understand God more, and we'll also keep from becoming arrogant towards the branches, and that's literally what Paul warns against in Romans chapter 11. So, Fraser at this point wants us to appreciate the connectedness of the Old Testament to the New, or that's what it seems to me. And if that's what he's about, well then, I'm all for it. Shift it. it it's, it's not an upgrade of Judaism. It's an upgrade of the Old Testament. And that's correct in the same okay. way that rabbinic literature is an upgrade of the Old Testament. Because right. both Judaism and Christianity, or is an upgrade of the Tanakh, right? The, the Jewish right. Bible. Because yes. what Christianity is, is commentary on. And nobody's practicing the type of Judaism that Jesus was practicing, Second Temple Judaism. So you've got rabbinic commentary over here saying, here's how we understand Deuteronomy, or here's how we understand Leviticus. And you've got the New Testament over here saying, here's how we understand Deuteronomy, and here's how we understand Leviticus. It's, 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 the old, it's an older text for both of us. I just want old to be respected, and that's why I want to recuperate that term. So, again, 
the most quoted book by Jesus from the Torah was Deuteronomy. So I'm I'm hoping that you're tracking the discussion. Um, my assessment of this so far, at least from Dr. Levine's perspective, is she says a lot of accurate things about Jesus and what he was doing in the first century, but she falls short of capturing Jesus' full mission and the full meaning behind his statements, probably because she refuses to see him as Messiah and Lord and Savior. So, because of that, she has a reductionistic view of Jesus that keeps her from truly seeing him. But but you, you cast this as one of the problems, in a sense, Giles. It's both a blessing and a curse. The universality of Christianity also means that it becomes a sort of something that begins once, I suppose, Rome gets involved um, to be imposed upon people. And to, uh, and, and is, that, is that your problem with the way that it was ultimately divorced from its Jewish roots? Well, I've got lots of problems, but this is one of them. Um, so one of the things that, um, that the Stalinists uh, accused Jews of being was rootless cosmopolitans. Uh, that's a that's a that's a thing that's that's regularly accused that's not jews that's christians who are rootless cosmopolitans uh, fundamentally uh, christianity uh, judaism is a, a, a religion that has a, has a rootedness in place christianity is is rootless it has no it has no ultimate loyalty to place now i have a i i christianity is rootless i'm letting that one sit for a moment i'm a i'm a i'm a let him finish I'm going to let him finish. But to say Christianity is rootless, to hear this with my pastor ears, it's a poor choice of words. We have a vine that we are connected to as branches. Jesus is the vine that we are connected to. He is our root. Paul says in Romans chapter 11 that we have been grafted into an olive tree, and it is the root of the olive tree that nourishes and supports us. So, rootless i mean that's it's a poor choice of words if perhaps fraser is trying to make some other kind of point then maybe uh, i'm gonna let him finish there are good things and bad things about about rootedness in place uh, and there are good things and bad things about as it were your internationalism the bad thing about christian internationalism is it can very easily um, uh, sit alongside the desire for empire so the idea of converting the world and empire and the say the British Empire, those two things were were, were they cooperated with each other. Um, so that that's part of the problem. I love you. I love everybody. You will all think exactly as I do. Now, that's a dangerous that's a dangerous part of Christianity. You know, I embrace you all. But what I'm really asking you to do is to think like me. OK, now that's that's the that's, you know, I. I I take you seriously. I want you to believe what I do, but there's a, there is a sort of like a, there is a dangerous quality to that. Um, so Christian nationalism um, is heavily criticized right now as being a problem. It's dangerous. Uh, it leads to all sorts of trouble. But now I'm supposed to understand that Christian internationalism is also very dangerous and is a problem. <laughs> like, where, where do we go from here? Uh, I, I think Fraser should just slow down and choose his words a bit more carefully because he's, he's speaking about concepts in a misleading way. Christianity is not the issue that he's pointing out or he, that he thinks is the issue. The, the issue is the marriage of certain church leaders with imperial power in history. That, that's what the issue is. Christianity doesn't have anything to do with that. Jesus didn't say to work together with the Roman government in order to go make disciples. He just said, go make more disciples. When church leaders in the past have done this kind of thing, I would argue they have stepped outside the parameters of the biblical injunction uh, and need to return to it because Christianity teaches and reinforces an inverted power structure. The last shall be first and the first shall be last. In order to be Jesus' disciple, you must become a servant. Jesus said that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve others. And that ethic is expected in all of Jesus' followers, whether you're a pastor, you're a shepherd, you're a deacon, you're a congregant, whatever. So Christianity is not the problem. It's those who purport to speak and act in the name of Christ, but don't actually obey what he said to do. Those folks, I think, are who Fraser takes issue with here. On the flip side, 
that there is a different sort of dangerous quality. It's not as dangerous actually as Christianity, but there's a sort of like um, you can get with Judaism. You can get a sort of like we're, we're this is this is us. This is what we think. We don't want to convert you. We're not that bothered about what you think. <laughs> that, that's not <laughs> totally true because it shouldn't be true because um, one of the things that's there from Abraham through Isaiah and so forth is that the Jewish people who are chosen by God are also chosen, are also a blessing to the, the Gentiles, to the nations, to all of us. And so, you know, that the, there is a there is a there is an obligation on Jews to explain and to model how they are also a blessing to the world. Um, but nonetheless, there is a very, very different sort of experience. And I think there's good and bad in both, actually. Um, and, and I think uh, that I think that is I think it's a complicated thing. But that's where I think the for me, that's one of the big tensions. This conversation is quickly turning into a hot mess. And again, I, I usually understand the discussions and the heart behind the discussions when it comes to unbelievable. I don't get this kind of conversation at all. I really don't. Justin Brierley is a Christian, and yet he's brought on these two folks to have a discussion that seriously misleads people about the nature and the teaching of Jesus Christ, as well as the philosophy and the ethic of Christianity. And I'm not, look, I'm not coming down on Justin here at all. I'm just saying, I don't get why this discussion exists. Do you? If you understand what's happening here and why, <laughs> let me know in the comments. I just, I'm scratching my head here at this point. I think about it. Um, and this, this goes back to, this goes back to another error that, that some of my friends make. So um, I'm presuming that, that most of your listeners have heard of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Um, where this question of, you know, who, the, the lawyer says, who is my neighbor? Um, and my Christian friends go, oh, that's a terrible question because everybody's your neighbor, right? What? No! Um, <laughs> it, your neighbor is your fellow Jew, right? And if you read Leviticus where it says, love your neighbor as yourself in Leviticus 90, that really does mean fellow Jew. The problem is if you read on in Leviticus, which Christians tend not to do because Leviticus doesn't come into the church the same way that Isaiah or the Psalms does. Is the same chapter in Leviticus goes on to say you have to love to, you have to love the stranger who who lives because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. In other words, Jews have two categories: you've got a neighbor and you've got strangers, and you have to love them both. Um, and you can see that in Jesus' parable of the uh, the uh, the final judgment, the sheep and the goats. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Right? Um, what happens in Christianity is the character the 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 category of stranger drops out. You're either the neighbor, which means you're a fellow Christian, you're a potential neighbor, or you're a heretic or an apostate or an infidel, and therefore we're going to kill you. Um, so it's a question of... What happens in Christianity is that the category of stranger drops out. You're either a neighbor or you're a heretic, and we're going to kill you. That's not Christianity. Have, have people labeled as heretics and persecuted people before in... In the name of Jesus Christ, yeah. When they did it, though, were they acting commensurate with what Jesus taught? No. And I would um, challenge either Dr. Levine or Fraser to go to the scripture and point out where exactly Jesus or the other authors ever taught Christians to do such a thing. Even when Paul warned first century Christians with some of his letters about false teaching, he talked about excommunication uh, and the reason he did that was to preserve the teaching of Christ amongst the believers. So again, this is not a Christianity problem. And so I hope you're paying attention to this, because when these folks talk this way, after presenting themselves as being knowledgeable about the Bible and, you know, the teachings of Jesus, I think Dr. Levine said, you know, I, I know the original biblical languages. You think to yourself, wow, there's, a, there's a, some authority there. There's a lot of credibility. But then when they say these things— I think it harms their credibility because they're not accurately capturing Christianity with these comments. As a matter of fact, these comments are getting worse and worse as time goes on. How, how do you deal with how do you deal with the other without trying to make the other you? Um, and that's that's the dangerous side of a universe. That's the other thing, too. Dr. Levine brought up the parable of the Good Samaritan. The whole point is that the ethic of the Christian is once again inverted. Okay, you no longer should think in terms of who is my neighbor. That was a very Jewish thing to do, right? The lawyer is the one that asked Jesus. Jesus didn't just bring this up. He is prompted because the lawyer 
asks the question, right? Who is my neighbor? The, the implicit other eventually pops up in the conversation. And instead of answering the question, he gives the parable. And the answer is in the parable. And the answer is, you are the neighbor. The answer to the question, who is my neighbor, is you. And if you are the neighbor, that means everyone is in your neighborhood. Because guess what? Wherever you go, there you are. So, again, this is a fundamental misunderstanding of the teaching of Jesus. Dr. Levine understands the Jewish reading of the Old Testament command in Leviticus 19, right? Your neighbor is your fellow Jew. She's totally right about that. But then she misses what Jesus did in order to reorient God's people to the true divine ethic that everyone should follow. And again, if you are the neighbor to everyone, and therefore you must love everyone around you and treat them as you would yourself— then it makes no sense to say that heretics must be killed. You know, think like me or die. That is so far from the teaching of Jesus Christ. Um, so it's a question of how, how do you deal with how do you deal with the other without trying to make the other you? Um, and that's that's the dangerous side of a universalistic rather than as as Giles correctly noted an ethnically based religion. You can convert to Judaism if you want, which makes you a member of the Jewish people. Uh, but you don't have to, and Jews aren't banging on your door saying, have you met Moses? <laughs> no, they're not. I don't understand this point at all. What does having an ethnically based religion have to do with sharing your faith with other people? Y you know what it is? Both of these individuals talk on and on without ever mentioning sin. Have you noticed that? If you take sin out of the equation, um, and I suppose by extension the consequences of sin, which is eternal separation from God in hell, well then you get to say things like this, well, you know, the danger in talking to other people about your Christian convictions is trying to turn them into you. No, the danger is in not fulfilling the Great Commission that Jesus gave us. Because the danger is that the people that God has placed around you will continue to reject God and one day die and go to hell. The danger is in taking the talent that God has given you and burying it in your backyard and then facing the Lord one day and hearing him ask you, what did you do with the opportunities and the abilities that I gave you? The greatest talent that we could ever share is God's word. But does that look like convert or die? Or, or does it look like Peter and the, the Jews of the diaspora in Acts chapter 2? Does it look like Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch uh, later in the book of Acts? Does it look like uh, Paul and the Greeks at the Areopagus in Acts chapter 17. Oh, how dare you try to make other people like you? No. Christians are fellow beggars telling other starving people where to find bread. It's not about us at all. It's not about being like us. It's about being with God and being like Jesus. I mean, I, I'm, and what's your feeling, though? I mean, it is obviously an evangelistic religion, AJ. Yes. Um, do you... Do you have a problem with that? I mean, is is it, it, would you is that a downside of Christianity, or is it just part and parcel of of what the religion is in a sense? You know, oh, I have so much fun when evangelists come to my door. I I just love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do you want to start with the Greek or the Hebrew? Um, I, no, I think Christians <laughs> ought to evangelize because Christians are commanded to do so. Uh, the Great Commission in Matthew is go make disciples. Well, you can okay. translate it all the Gentiles and let the Jews off the hook. Mm -hmm. uh, but that original mission uh. to the Jews never got abrogated, right? That's still there. Um, and while Paul is out dealing with his... Why why would we let Jewish non-believers off the hook? Well, you know, all the nations. Go go and make disciples of all the nations, but we should let the Jews off the hook. Why should we let Jewish non-believers off the hook? Does Dr. Levine not know that Jesus came to his own first? And why did he do that? Because they need the gospel just as much as anyone else. The law is insufficient to save anyone. That's Romans chapter 8. I mean, you read the book of Hebrews. <sighs> Boy, I don't know how much more I can take. Let's, start, let's, just, let's do a little bit more here. Gentile audience, Peter takes his role as, as the apostle to the Jews. So that's still out there, but it's a matter of not, should you evangelize? If you want to, by all means, do so. Uh, but how do you do it? And how do you do it with respect for your fellow Jew or your fellow Hindu or Muslim or whoever? And you do it not by telling the other person what's wrong with that person's religion. You do it by telling the person what's right with your religion, right? So what? I, I say to my students, if you want to evangelize. <laughs> what? Well, she's, she's zoomed in on something that is of consequence, right? How should we evangelize? How should we share the gospel? And the answer is, 
in a manner that will lead to discipleship. Because that's the job Jesus gave us all, to go and make disciples. So, whatever manner of evangelism leads to, connects to, biblical discipleship, then do it. But that's not what Dr. Levine is suggesting. She's suggesting that we respect other people's faiths. Really? Is that what Elijah did with the prophets of Baal? Is that what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did with Nebuchadnezzar? They just, you know what, they just respected other people's faiths. Seems to me that when you respect other faiths in the Bible, it leads to all kinds of trouble. Just look at Solomon. I mean, is this really the advice of someone who knows their scripture? Uh, Again, it just sounds to me like two people having a conversation without admitting or even realizing what is actually at stake here. Even Dr. Levine has to recognize that God judges his own people. And if it happened before in the Old Testament, it's bound to happen again if they refuse to obey the voice of the Lord and recognize his handiwork. I mean, read Deuteronomy chapter 28. Meditate on the promises that God gives in Deuteronomy chapter 28 if you violate his uh, covenant. They're not good promises, by the way. And, and, And if you read that, it certainly does not suggest that the Mosaic covenantal dynamic was always going to be around. A change was a coming. That was that was part of the promise that was given in the Old Testament. Um, and Jesus brings that new covenant in. All right, okay. All right. I think I got it. I think I got the gist. Okay, I got it. This was a video unlike any I've seen before on Unbelievable. Um, it seems like, for the most part, the Jew and the Anglican both agree with their assessment of Jesus and Christianity. You know, it, it just seemed like there wasn't a whole lot of clash going on. Uh, which is, again, surprising. I think that's what I was thinking in the back of my mind when I was watching this video is, where is the clash? I mean, if this is unbelievable and you have a Jew who doesn't believe in Jesus as the Messiah talking about Jesus, shouldn't you bring somebody else on who kind of represents the other side of the fence there? But that's not what was going on here. All I can tell you is this kind of conversation is what happens when you do not take the totality of Scripture seriously. Uh, when you begin with certain assumptions about Jesus, that he was just a Jew, and you you downplay or you downright ignore biblical conceptions of sin and redemption, well then, you get the kind of discussion that we just saw. Don't disrespect other people's faiths. Don't try to make other people like you. These are horrible conclusions. Even if you are concerned with how folks in the name of Jesus Christ have acted in the past, you still are not justified in drawing the kinds of conclusions that Dr. Levine or Mr. Fraser made. And especially for Mr. Fraser, who I take it believes in Jesus, uh, and so therefore should take seriously Jesus' command to go make more disciples. That, that Jesus' message, that his communication and the teaching that he gave is not substantively different from what Paul was saying. Paul was the one commissioned by Jesus. That, that's bizarre. I think if we truly appreciate what is at stake, then we will recognize that there is an urgency of the moment, okay, for everyone on this planet. And I think that we would be motivated, all of us, to fulfill the great commission that Jesus gave us. That's my take on this video. What do you think? Was this a great discussion about Jesus? What would you have said in a discussion like this? I'm dying to know. Let me know in the comments below and I'll interact with them. Uh, I've got more videos coming up soon, including an actual debate teacher reacts, finally. So stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, I'll say bye for now.